Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Modem. I'm uh, Clementine Proby, I'm an assistant curator here uh, at the museum. And um, I'm very happy to welcome you for Vit Simonetti's lecture, um, which is uh, titled Art, Bureaucracy and Resistance, and which is part of the public program associated um, with Sung Tieu's exhibition, uh, which is entitled Civic Floor and still on view in the pavilion uh, uh, here at Modam. Uh, it's an exhibition that uh, considers um, how ideology applies to design and architecture, and especially in the case of uh, carceral spaces and bureaucracy, bureaucratic systems. Um, so Vid's uh, lecture is very much going to draw on Sung's work, and I invite you to visit the exhibition if you haven't done so yet. Um, because I think it will give you a very interesting highlight uh, on uh, Sung Chiu's practice. Uh, just a few words about Vid's um, bio. Um, so Vid Simonetti is a lecturer in philosophy of art at the University of Liverpool, where he's also running the MA program in art, philosophy and cultural institutions. In 2021, he was selected as the BBC New Generation Thinker, and he has also been hosting the Art Against the World podcast in collaboration with the Liverpool Biennial. His book, Art Against the World, invest investigating the place of contemporary art within democratic public sphere, is forthcoming with Yale University Press in 2023. So now I leave the floor to you, Vid. Thank you. There we go, I'll try again. Thank you so much, Clementine, for this really kind introduction. And thank you all uh, for coming, especially on a wintry Sunday like this, where you might want to prefer to stay indoors and watch Netflix or something like this. So yes, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll conduct this talk in English. I mean, my German is sort of passable. My French, I can sort of say l'addition in a restaurant and my Luxembourgish is non-existent. So uh, thank you so much for bearing with me in, in English. So, I'll begin with a little anecdote when we speak about bureaucracy and bureaucratic reason. And this was uh, a couple of years ago when I gave a talk, not unlike this one, at the University of Padova in Italy, which is a beautiful, beautiful town, uh, which I completely recommend going to visit. And after I gave my talk, you know, I think it was about art and politics, that's kind of my shtick, it's kind of what I talk about. After I gave my talk, I needed to get my flights reimbursed. You know, I flew with EasyJet from uh, London, I think, to Venice. And I said, you know, now it'd be great to get uh, some money back for the flights. And they said, oh, yes, of course, but we need your boarding pass. And I said, um, well, I have the receipt. I have the receipt that I used to pay for my flight, but I don't have the boarding pass because the boarding pass was on my app, on my phone. And they said, uh, you know, dear Dr. Simoniti, that's wonderful that you have the receipt, but we really need the boarding pass because that's the rules. You need the boarding pass. No boarding pass, no reimbursement. And I said, but uh, why do you need the boarding pass? And they said, well, we needed to prove that you were here. And I said, but I was there. I mean, you saw me. I was literally there giving this talk. And they said, yes, but um, that doesn't count as proof. What counts as proof is uh, the boarding pass. And so I sort of thought about it and I said, um, okay, well, here's the boarding pass. And I just sent them the boarding pass and they said, thank you very much. And they paid me the money. But if you look very carefully on this boarding pass, um, you see that on the 12th of January and the 15th of January when I flew, if you look very, very carefully, you see that Saturday, 12th of January is a little bit smaller than Tuesday, the 15th of January. And that's because I actually forged this boarding pass. I didn't have the boarding pass. <laughs> so uh, I printed off an old boarding pass and I scanned it and I went into Photoshop and I sort of moved things around and I sent this off. Um, please don't share this with the University of Padova or Italy in general because, you know, I might get arrested next time I'm there. Um, but I like to bring this up because I think it's an example of something that we might call the bureaucratic moment. So this is a moment where we encounter a bureaucratic system which is 
eminently reasonable and we think to ourselves this was something that was created by human minds this bureaucratic system in order to make our life a lot easier but then what the system completely lacks is a different kind of reason it lacks a certain kind of thoughtfulness right it lacks the kind of everyday common sense reason that we recognize in other humans and sometimes this manifests itself in uh, what we might call completely first world problems, right? A lecturer from Liverpool getting somewhere on EasyJet and getting 200 euros back. I mean, you know, it's not a big deal. It was very annoying, but uh, it's not a life or death situation. Um, and sometimes we encounter these bureaucratic moments in these very everyday scenarios, you know, when you need a form from the city council or when that computer image is asking you to confirm that you're not a robot and you're clicking on different traffic lights to prove to a robot that you're not a robot um, but in other situations it can of course be a life and death kind of scenario if you're applying for asylum or if you are applying against deportation or perhaps if you're trying to prove in the court of law that you're innocent of a crime that you didn't commit these kind of bureaucratic moments, this realization that there is a whole entirely rational system which nevertheless cannot speak to you as a human is a difficult and a threatening one indeed. Now this bureaucratic moment, I think, this realization with a system of reason greater than ourselves is central to Sung Tzu's work especially this exhibition that you can see here at Mudam. So I'll just talk a little bit about the exhibition because perhaps not everyone has seen it. But what you see on the first floor as you enter the pavilion are these uh, kind of minimalistic sculptures made out of metal, made out of steel. And what they have inside is earth piled up. And these uh, sculptures, when you look at them at first time, they might look like something that's come out of a spaceship enterprise or something like that. They have this kind of minimalist, cool beauty about them. But when you read up about them and perhaps explore them, you see that the little spaces, little enclosures inside are actually uh, plans. They're kind of florices or floor plans of prisons, of different prisons that Sung Tzu has explored in her research practice. So uh, some of them, perhaps the most famous design of a prison is the 19th century radial design, which philosophers like Jeremy Bentham or then later and more critically Michel Foucault talked about as the panopticon. So what, whoops, sorry. Just, it's just a water bottle. Um, so what you have here in the middle, so you can see the same panopticon there top right. Um, what you have in the middle is a tower and inside the tower you have a guard who can survey like the entire prison which is then spreading out like rays and the idea of the panopticon a very well known idea of the panopticon is that at any point it's not the point that you can be surveyed from the tower but at no point are you sure whether there's someone in the tower or not and so there you're always possibly being observed by someone um, so this is a very famous example of prison architecture, which has been discussed a lot in 20th century philosophy. But uh, Sung Tzu then uh, discusses or rather performs other prison architecture as it develops through the ages. And I'll just show you the very final sculpture, which you can see there, which is a kind of a strange, irregular, um, triangular sculpture, uh, structure where the, one of the points of it seems to be that it allows a different kind of surveillance. It has these acute angles, which are apparently easier to monitor by cameras. And the same kind of like acute angles also make it more difficult for a human to orient himself or herself in space. Now, prison architecture is perhaps the most bureaucratic kind of architecture there is, because here, uh, a certain kind of ordering reason is ordering not just a way to live but every single aspect of your life right how you live how you sleep how you exercise how you eat but that's not the only kind of bureaucratic element in Sung Tzu's exhibition so on the same floor going around you see these uh, forms these kind of white uh, plaster uh, plaster of uh, Paris I think or plaster cast forms 
which uh, have these like little squares and little lines and little boxes inside of them. And what they really are is, um, well, it is forms, but that is to say what in German you might call, call formulaire or formulaire in French. So they are forms that you're supposed to fill out. And the ones that Sung Tzu has taken are forms that are um, used to make an asylum, uh, an asylum application or uh, other applications to do with asylum status, like to get your family reunited or to waive certain uh, criminal checks when you do your asylum application. Um, so, you know, you really, I think, with the kind of precision and formality that is so typical of Sung Tzu's practice, you have here this sense once you realize this, that here are these squares and the entirety of a complex human life is supposed to be poured into these forms. But the bit that I find like perhaps the most moving or the kind of like the cleverest in this exhibition are these like little plaques that you see here on the left. And these are the ones that really connect the two works. So you can see here it says things like bars, uh, 1A and 1B, uh, then blocks, then boxes, then cells, then lines. And when you're first looking at this, you kind of think, oh, blocks, cells, lines. She's talking about aspects of prison architecture. But actually, what she's talking about is the square millimeter space that you have to write down your life story when you make your asylum application, right? So something that initially, I think, when you walk into the room, into this like beautiful sunlit Mudan pavilion, something that initially looks like a piece of minimalist design, you know, something that, um, you know, a person who's way too rich to shop in Ikea would buy, even though, you know, the aesthetic is similarly kind of minimalist, um, actually turns out to have like a much more sinister message and uh, a much more acute commentary on particularly asylum seeker application situation. Something that we might speculate also derives from Sung Tzu's personal biography. So as I think you might know from the artist talk that she gave here, uh, she is a German citizen who emigrated to Germany uh, from Vietnam in the 90s. Her father was a contract worker and she has personal experience as a child of detention of, a, of um, citizenship and a permit of residence applications. So, you know, it's something that derives from her personal experience as well. Now, next, what I'd like to do is actually to think a little bit about this in like the broader kind of context of um, thinking about bureaucracy through art. Like, why is bureaucracy like such a kind of like such a dry topic, right? What role does it play in art? Now, if we just look sort of at literature, let's say, then I think it is a distinctly modern subject. So even though all civilizations, right, going right back, if you like, to the Sumerians, have had forms of democracy, sorry, had not democracy, have had forms of bureaucracy, um, bureaucracy as a subject for literature or as a theme in art is definitely something that arises, I think, perhaps one of you will correct me, but I think arises with the 19th century. Now, initially, I think, uh, a lot of it has to do with a kind of a forms of satire. So you might know the great Ukrainian-Russian writer Nikolai Gogol and his various tales of bureaucratic life in the overcoat, in the nose, or in this marvelous play, The Government Inspector, or Revisor in Russian. Um, where an important, well, what seems like an important, important government inspector comes to a little Russian village and all the bureaucrats, you know, the mayor, the inspector of charities, all the judge, they're all kind of like scattered to hide the little corruptions that have been going on in small town Russia. Or you might think even, let's say, of Alice in Wonderland. So you might remember there's a scene in Alice in Wonderland where she stands accused before the court of the heart of the queen and king of hearts. Uh, and she is in this courtroom and she's growing larger and larger and kind of like filling out this courtroom. And at some point she topples over this box in which the jury is sitting, you know, this typical surrealist situation. And the king of hearts turns to her and says, everyone who is over eight foot tall you know, who's over three meters tall, has to exit the courtroom now. And she says, well, um, you know, who says so? And he says, uh, it's rule number 43. It's the oldest rule in the book. 
And she says, well, if it's the oldest rule in the book, then why is it not rule number one? Why is it rule number 43? <laughs> you know, so it's this kind of taking the mickey, making fun of bureaucracy, which is, I think, a feature of someone like Lewis Carroll in Alice in Wonderland. But it's really then with the 20th century, when we get a bureaucracy to possess this kind of demonic theme, where bureaucracy becomes conceptualized as one of the main enemies, if you like, of individual agency, of human subjectivity. And there's no one who does that more canonically than, of course, Franz Kafka, with his uh, The Trial, Der Prozess, uh, and his The Castle, Das Schloss. Uh, in, for example, in The Trial, we have Josef K., a middling bank manager who suddenly finds himself accused of something. He never finds out what he is being accused of. He is being tried, he is being pushed back and forth by this anonymous bureaucracy. He has no idea what's happening, and in the end, he's being he's led off and killed with a kitchen knife. In Das Schloss, it's a bit less grim at the end, but there's a similar bureaucratic thing at place. So here, I think we really get this idea of modern bureaucracy as something bad in art, right? Where the main enemy of the protagonist is not an evil antagonist, right? It's not the queen of the night or, you know, some, some kind of evil person. The antagonist is not a person. It's a reason, but it's not a person. It's a kind of a nameless system that we have ourselves created. And you find this theme in different ways, I think, in countless uh, works in the later 20th century. You know, you might mention 1984, which creates, which is about bureaucracy from a specifically totalitarian lens. Um, even in some comedies, I'm not going to go into more detail, but I'll just mention maybe a kind of a problem that emerges in contemporary literature, which is a sort of division between those who talk about the bureaucrat, and you might think of someone like uh, Kazuo Ishiguro uh, with The Remains of the Day, where you have a butler who obeys, who does everything that he is told, um, you know, and then it turns out that his employer is a Nazi and so forth. But, uh, or you might think of uh, something like the film The Lives of Others, which is also about a spy in the German Stasi, in, the, in East Germany, right? So those work which think about, well, how does the bureaucrat think? Who is this, you know, gray presence who signs forms and, uh, you know, acts as the tool of bureaucracy? And on the other hand, you have those who focus on the victims of bureaucracy. And I will just mention here a very recent film from last year, actually Limbo uh, by Ben Sharak, which is, a, I think, a very brilliant film about a Syrian asylum seeker in Scotland, you know, in the kind of situation that he undergoes. So you can either look at the problem of bureaucracy from the point of view of the bureaucrat or from the user, if you like. Um, but both of these in 20th century paint quite a grim picture. Okay, let's look into a little bit more detail, just because I really love Kafka. But like, let's have a little bit mo more detail in a few passages from Der Prozess and just compare that for fun with Sung Tzu's work and see what we can get out of it. So, um, Josef K. is in his room. He gets accosted by these uniformed policemen and he describes one of these policemen or officials who's arresting him. He was slim but firmly built his clothes were black and close-fitting, with many folds and pockets, buckles and buttons and a belt, all of which gave the impression of being very practical, but without making it very clear what they were actually for. So you have this person dressed up in a way that looks like really practical and useful. You know, that's how I think of people who go camping. Um, but, you know, someone who has all of these buckles and all of these things, and so it makes you think, well, the point of bureaucracy is often to make you think that everything has been thought through, that everything is really useful. And just the same, you might think of Sung Tzu's form, right? Everything is really ordered. There's, you know, some, some um, columns on the left or some rows on the right. There's some boxes to tick. Like, it's all perfectly fitting and you're supposed to put your whole life in here, <laughs> right? So the first point of this comparison is bureaucracy appears useful or projects this kind of appearance of usefulness. Then he says, uh, when these people are arresting him, he says, Josef K., 
What sort of people were these? What were they talking about? What office did they belong to? Ka was living in a free country after all. Everywhere was at peace. Laws, laws were decent and were upheld. Who were these to accost him in his own home? So bureaucracy only appears to us as a problem when we ourselves are threatened, right? Most of the time, things go pretty smoothly, right? You get reimbursed for your flights, you click on those traffic cones in the, in the sort of thing that the computer wants you to click on. So most of the time, bureaucracy seems fine, but it's when it's directed against you that you start noticing its cruelty. And finally, I really like this passage. Uh, so he's still being arrested. This is all from chapter one. They are talking about things of which they don't have the slightest understanding anyway. It's only because of their stupidity that they are able to be so sure of themselves. I just need a few words with someone of the same social standing as myself, and everything will be comparably clearer, much clearer than a conversation with these two can make it. So Josef K., who is a bank official, thinks to himself, these lowly, you know, working class policemen, they don't really know what they're doing. I need to talk to someone like myself, you know. And so all the kind of social distinctions that we think are neutralized by bureaucracy are actually emphasized by bureaucracy, right? When you're faced with a bureaucratic problem, you ask yourself, do I maybe know someone who works in parliament? Do I maybe know someone who's a lawyer? Do I maybe know, you know, someone who can help me? I, a respectable middle-class person with connections, can surely overcome this problem, right? So bureaucracy, even though it appears neutral here, as it does in Sung Tzu's exhibition, actually emphasizes the differences that already exist between us. Okay, so here's, so we've said a few things about how bureaucracy appears in 20th century European art and how it might carry over into Sung Tzu's arresting works. But, of course, Sung Tzu's work is not a novel, right? It deals with these questions in a very different way from a Kafka novel or a film. So, what is gained, or let's put it differently, what is different when we approach these things through art, right? Why are we going to museums to talk about bureaucracy or about politics or about you know, anything at all, if you like? What is it about art, visual art, that kind of helps us to have a way into this question? Now, that's a huge question, right, which, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe Clementine will, will, will tell us more about. Or, um, but uh, it's, yeah, it, it's something that I think everyone working with the arts is wondering about. But what I would like to do now is just to sort of place Sung Tzu's uh, work a little bit in the recent history of art and to think about where her idiom comes from. Why is she making the forms in the way that she makes them? So I don't think that a practice like hers would be possible, of course, had we not had the history of what is sometimes very broadly and very contentiously called, called postmodernism or movements after first modernism, uh, and more precisely, perhaps, conceptual art. So let me give an example from the United States where a lot of this kind of conceptual work sort of germinated in the 1960s. So, okay, let's think about actually one step back. Let's think about, say, Jackson Pollock, right? The abstract expression is the abstract shapes on the walls in the 1950s. So if you like, very, very simplified, but let's say uh, 1950s, you know, Jackson Pollock's there in New York. Everyone's thinking about art as the expression of your innermost being, which you... Uh, viscerally expressed by putting it out onto the canvas, by splattering it out in some way. Now, you know, there's a lot of art historical debate about this, but let's just take this as a simplification, because simplifications are sometimes useful. Now, what then happens with the next generation that partly in contradistinction, partly in trying to differentiate themselves from this unbridled expression, what they do, at least some of them, is to go into purer forms of abstraction, abstraction which appears to be ruled by an impartial, non-human in some way, reason. So let's think, for example, about Saul LeWitt, um, one of the artists of 1960s conceptualism, 
uh, and a work lo like his serial project. So often these artists would work in series. And here you see on the left hand side his preparatory sketch, right? I mean, these don't look unlike Sung Tzu's work in some way. So um, each of these is supposed to be a kind of a permutation of another form. So you have a square with no square inside, a square with little square inside, a big, you know, sorry, a cube with a rectangular shape inside. You can kind of see a logic, right, when you look at these. But what is the logic, right? There is, th there is no preordained reason why this should be the way it is. It is pure... It is a very pure art. It's a very pure joy. It is a joy which you're supposed to feel purely by the ability of witnessing how another mind has formed these things into a kind of a, like a rational sequence. Lewitt himself thought that his art should give an impression of listening to Bach or someone like this, right? There's no emotion here. It is art of pure permutation, of pure reason. Another artist who worked in this uh, in this manner, and who I think bears even closer relation to Sung Tzu's work, is the American artist Adrian Piper. So here is a very uh, early work. Uh, this is actually a picture I took in, in, the, in her archives. Um, so this is a very early work by Piper, which is still, I think, clearly influenced by Lewitt. And we have like similar kind of permutations of shapes happening. But the reason why Piper is interesting is that she later, much like Sung Tzu, um, takes this formal language, this cruel beauty of minimalism, and applies it to more political issues. So here, for example, Piper exhibited these questionnaires, questionnaires which are a little bit like forms, like the formular, formularen that uh, Tzu also exhibits. Um, and what you can see here is, for example, on the right hand, well, on the left hand side, a question. Do you have at least one black colleague at your place of employment? If yes, in what manner do you socialize in the workplace? A one on one dinner, business lunch, coffee break, office party gathering? None of the above. Have you ever had sexual relations with a black person? If yes, what social events did you attend together? Family reunions? dinners, etc. with close friends, job-related dinners, parties or outings, dinners, etc. with acquaintances, outside entertainment, movies, sports, etc. None of the above. So there is a kind of, a, you know, Piper herself is here using a very bureaucratic language to kind of poke quite an uncomfortable bone in 1980s New York art world, which you might say, like, you know, outwardly was very, um, probably very liberal, very civil, um, but within which um, she herself, as an African-American, still noticed various, you know, problems with racism and uh, various kind of structural injustices, if you like. But I don't want to talk so much about the American context specifically, right? But like the form, right? So here is the very cool, cruel... Um, impersonal address of the formula, which is now being used to ask you something really personal and to actually get you to think about to what extent do you live by your morals. And I think that what perhaps Piper is trying to show her audience is that actually all of these nice people who are going, or many of these nice people or nice people like us, who are going to um, you know, art events in New York or somewhere else and who are living very respectable lives are actually kind of ticking boxes. It's like, uh, do I have a few diverse friends? Tick. Uh, do I do a little bit of charity? Tick. Do I, uh, am I a good and upstanding citizen? Tick. Right? So you tick these boxes and you convince yourself that you're a good person, let's say. Um, now, okay, it's, it's, not a, you know, it's not an easy work, it's not a friendly work, if you like, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's certainly a bit like kind of politically uh, damning. Um, maybe I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll talk a bit about this as a bit of a difficult one. But um, what we get to, I think, like with a lot of these works is not just the form of bureaucracy in the end, 
but a certain kind of psychology of bureaucracy, right? Like, it's actually very hard, I think, for us as human beings to get out of our habits, right? We're constantly ticking boxes. We're, you know, it, it would be too much to ask us to be constantly creative, let's say. But as uh, most famously Hannah Arendt has noted in her report on the Eichmann trial in Israel, right, that is precisely the certain kind of mentality to leads to what she has called so influentially banality of evil. I'm not going to read out these uh, long extracts. But the basic point that Eichmann wants to, uh, sorry, that Arendt wants to make about Eichmann is this. When you are in a position of power, where evil comes from, or where great transgression comes from, is not from um, people having these demonic evil uh, desires to kind of destroy others necessarily. Where it comes from is from simply following rules, right? from simply following rules, from applying what has been given to you from above, and uh, then not necessarily questioning it. Now, we can talk a bit more in the Q&A if you like about you know, the kind of disputes around our, in Arendt scholarship about uh, what exactly she, she, she meant. But the, I think the key takeaway point here is this. Just as bureaucracy makes us uh, into, just as when we are, faced with a bureaucratic moment and we bemoan the situation that we are kind of like victims of bureaucracy, more often than not, we are proceeding ourselves in much the same manner, right? We follow these rules, we apply them. And so the great kind of moral quality which is being sought in the 20th century is not the ability necessarily to follow rule, rules, but what Arendt said Eichmann, the great Nazi bureaucrat, lacked. So he says, um, she says here, it was not stupidity that he had, but a curious, quite authentic inability to think. What Eichmann lacked was what Arendt calls thought. It's, I mean, it's a very curious, it's a very philosophical formulation, but what I think she means is that in every step where you are required to follow a rule, you're faced with the option of following it, of executing the rule, or of thinking, and by thinking, I think what she means is constantly questioning. But can we constantly question? So I'd like to, before we kind of move into the Q&A, actually talk about another of Sung Tzu's works, also so that you get like a sense a little bit of, of her other work. So as I said before, her work, as we saw there, is very austere, right? It's very impersonal. There's almost like no remnants of humanity inside. But sometimes you, you, you do get a glimpse of humanity in her work. And for example, in this work, Zugzwang, which was shown at Haus der Kunst in Munich uh, two years ago. Uh, and here we have an office I also thought I would talk about this because we're in Luxembourg and it's quite close to the European Union and I think there are some interesting connections. So um, here we have an office of a fictional European bureaucrat called Alfred Stevens who has worked in various different uh, Abteilungen, various different uh, offices of the European Union. He's Irish. And uh, we only learn about him, really, by walking around the space and by finding different aspects of it. And so, okay, we see the office. Then here you see in the middle picture his desk. He has like a funny shark mug. He has a newspaper. He has some pictures. We see that on the pictures he has a Vietnamese family. So he has a Vietnamese wife and a child. This is actually a picture of Sung Tiu's uh, mother herself. And then there's like a kind of like an article here, an article in the local newspapers which sings the praises of the local bureau of, of the bureaucrat. And it sort of says, you know, we always talk about politicians, but what about all the wonderful people who wor who work in bureaucracy? And uh, he uh, says, for example, he's quoted in this newspaper as saying, quote, it is instrumental that we make humane decisions, he says. He often worked as a caseworker for refugees, but sadly, our boat can only hold so many. Stephen's own family has a long history of immigration, as so many Irish families do, and so forth. 
Uh, now on another bit he says, now that Stevens' stellar career is coming to a successful close, he is most looking forward to spending more time with his four grandchildren. The hours in Brussels can be grueling. We work until 9 p.m. every night, even Fridays, he says, refuting the often raised uh, accusation of civil servants Dolce Vita. So I think what I really like about Sung Tzu's work is that she's not, you know, hitting you over the head with a hammer of, of political convictions. We, ha we have here, like, a really quite a specific case of someone who really does seem to have led, you know, like, a good life according to their morals and probably did a lot of good in some way. But what sort of seeps through the cracks, what you sort of start noticing is like, oh my God, there are like all of these cases, all of these lives that this person had in his hands. Um, all of these, let's say, asylum applications, which a stroke of his pen could throw out of the window or uh, have accepted. So, again, we're faced, I think, with this key aspect of, of modernity, this sense that um, there's a higher reason, a reason which can rule us, but which itself somehow no longer seems human. You sort of want to go up to this man and say like, yeah, but what did you really think about these asylum seekers? What was your real opinion about them? Why did you let this one in or that one not? But he can't give you that answer because he's working on a completely different level of abstraction. Okay, so what should we say art can tell us about this situation? What can art teach us maybe? about the bureaucratic moment with which we find ourselves faced so often in modernity. Well, okay, art has many different options, right? Art can, like Kafka, create a kind of a dark satire of it. Like Ben Sherrock's film, it can tell us the human stories of the people trapped in the bureaucracy. Uh, it can give uh, a fine-tuned portrait of the bureaucrat in a way that Kazuo Ishiguro's novel uh, where the main character of Remains of the Day is also called Alfred Stevens. So Sung Tzu is quoting there. So art can do all of these different things, but what art certainly cannot do, right? It cannot actually solve the problems. And if we ask ourselves, well, what should we do day to day? You know, maybe, maybe you work in European bureaucracy or, you know, I make bureaucratic decisions in a small way as a lecturer. Like when you're faced with these kinds of decisions, well, what should you do? What should you do with this system? Um, and we cannot answer this question in a general way, right? We should reform the systems that are bad, we should uphold the systems that are good to some degree, but we should be aware that in modernity, whatever solution we come up with, we are always going to be creating new systems, and we're always going to be creating systems that, unfortunately, it seems, are creating uh, you know, terrible plights. You might, of course, have a political idea about this and you might think a completely different system would be you know, a better solution. But even then, even if you create, let's say, a socialist paradise, you will be faced with bureaucracy and everything that it brings with it. So, um, ultimately, I don't think that this kind of critical stance that art takes towards bureaucracy should lead us towards the thought that we should reject all systems, right? That we should become kind of fashionable anarchists. But rather, it shows us something else, that morality or, you know, the good life, the good politics is ultimately a system of rules. But in order to be moral, we mustn't only follow rules, we must also remain human. And to be human, we must ultimately be ready to break rules to not just embrace bureaucracy, but also to some extent chaos. Okay, I'll leave you with that and thank you very much for your time. And I think um, Clementine yes. says <laughs> that there's some Q&A. Feel free to go if you're very bored, um, but <laughs> otherwise, uh, you know, feel free to stay. Um, yeah, so um, thank you so much, Vid, uh, for this lecture. It was super interesting, super, super thought-provoking, I think, uh, and a real highlight on uh, Sung Chiu's work. Um, I was wondering, uh, maybe I start with a question, and uh, please do uh, ask any question or uh, give us any comment that you have uh, afterwards. 
Um, I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on how art forms, um, what's their specific role um, in a political discourse uh, as compared to other forms of knowledge? Because I know that you've uh, written uh, extensively about that. And uh, I think in, it would be interesting to know a bit more about your thoughts on this. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, I think one thing that I ask myself when I write about uh, art and politics, right, is that it's very easy to say, you know, this artist has a really radical political idea, right? This artist is really radically political. They're saying, you know, we should tear down all the prisons or something like this. Um, and you always, I always ask myself, well, but why not do that in a different way? Why not just join a protest or a political party or, um, you know, uh, do, if you like, politics within journalism, let's say. Okay, now this is like a big can of worms and a big question. But I think ultimately what art, and I'm speaking not just of visual art, but also of novels or literature, it allows us to create like that sense of puzzlement or that sense of kind of questioning, right? With an artwork, you very rarely just get a question. What you get, oh, sorry, what just get a statement. What you get is a process. So, for example, with uh, Sung Tzu's work, you might initially walk in and ideally, I think, you would walk in, see them only as beautiful objects, and then you sort of realize what they really are and you have this moment of shock. And then you look at the forms and then you begin to ask, well, what is my role with all of this? Am I upholding this, um, you know, this system, let's say? Is this system bad? So what art can do in a complete nutshell, as opposed to other forms of discourse, is that it suspends you in that moment. One of the things it can do that suspends you in that moment of uncomfortable questioning, right? Which is very hard to actually sustain. In real life, you brush it aside, right? You say, I don't have time for this. Um, that's, I think, in an ideal world, what art can create, that space to think. Thank you. Um, is there any question in the audience? Thank you. Uh, I have a question about uh, the evolution of practices with ID that are political between the 60s and now. What are the major differences? Yeah, so... Um, I mean, there are so many different practices today, you know, it's fair to say, right? I mean, today you have everything from protest art to conceptual art to everything. But maybe what I find super interesting about the 60s is that they are really the birth of the kind of way in which we think about contemporary art now. And we don't often realize that. And why? This was made in 1966, right? So you think 60s, hippies... Uh, sexual revolution, politics, blah, 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 right? All of that is happening. But these guys, conceptual artists in New York, were making this kind of work right up until 69, 70, and were not really thinking about their work in political terms necessarily. Maybe privately they were against the war in Vietnam, but they didn't show, you know, there's no Vietnam in this, right? No war in Vietnam in this. And then you get 1970 and you get exhibitions like the big exhibition in the Museum of Modern Art called Information. And suddenly these two things are forced together. Artists who are conceptualists, who are modernists, who are formalists, are simultaneously thought of as the source of political engagement. In 1970, in Information, in, in MoMA, you have works like this and then you have a curatorial text which says... Um, this is sort of somehow uh, anti-establishment. Uh, you know, anti and so you get this complete paradox, right? There is no political content in this. But you get the beginning of something very interesting, which is that you get the beginning of, I think, like you know, you know, artistic practice that can think about politics by presenting you with these questions, with these difficult forms. And I think this ultimately leads down to um, Sung, Sung Tzu's work. So, I mean, in a nutshell, I would say in the 1960s, artists were perhaps in the late 60s were very torn between formalism and protest, let's say. I think today you have like a much wider variety of expression. And I think, I don't know, a, a lot of work that fills, but the best work is the work that I think sustains that 
questioning uncomfortable moment for me. <laughs> Thanks. Um, ah, sorry. Thank you very much for your um, inspiring talk. Um, I have a comment and a question. The comment is that apart from Hannah Arendt, this was mainly staying in the realm of art, written art, novels or so, when it comes to um, criticizing uh, bureaucracy. And I thought, um, maybe, maybe you don't know the uh, German sociologist Max Weber, who, who has a wonderful quote, uh, which is the cold skeleton hands of bureaucracy, and that they would fit well, I think, in your uh, assemblage there. My question is to the work of Sung Chiu, mm -hmm. and what role the location actually plays for her installations. So whether she comes with this installation and then places them in whatever museum gives her in terms of space, or whether, particularly with the Zeughaus uh, installation, uh, the location, I mean, this was built uh, in 1937 and supervised by Adolf Hitler himself, the location where the installation is in there. I cannot imagine that she would be oblivious of the location mm -hmm. itself. So I was just wondering what the, in, in terms of the artistic process, um, where does the location come in? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I can only answer this question. Thank you very much for the Weber quote. I mean, I think he does absolutely fit into the, into the narrative. Um, with regards to her practice, um, I know that, for example, when you look at this work, there's, there's a kind of a soil, um, there's some dirt. You can sort of see that there's some dirt and soil inside the sculpture. And this is taken, I believe, from around the museum. Is that right, Clementine? So, so, there's a, so there is a kind of like a nod to, I think, the local in a sense that the forms that constrict us, the bureaucratic forms that, you know, even in carceral uh, architecture and more broadly, can of course be completely international and completely invisible, but the kind of uh, life that is being constrained is always somehow belonging to a particular locale. I mean, that's how I, this is my interpretation rather than her text. Um, I can't answer, you know, specifically about to what extent she engages with, uh, with local um, contexts, but you're right that, um, but, but her practice is certainly incredibly research driven. She's done also a lot of work with regards to um, Vietnamese contract workers, for example, and I think in Tsuk Tsvang, you actually, I don't have the slide, but in the um, in the um, frames there, I think you can see like some case studies of Vietnamese contract workers, if I'm not mistaken, you know, which uh, again is a situation very much to do with the reunified Germany where the workers were being sent back. Um, and yes, I cannot confirm your hypothesis, but given the kind of artist that she is and how kind of research driven her practices, I would not be surprised at all if that figured in her decision to make to make this work. But to make it even more specific, I would put this in Brussels, really, or like, you know, Luxembourg. I think it would work, work well here as well. Maybe you can bring it here next time. <laughs> Actually, maybe to complete uh, your answer, uh, Vid, um, the, the installation that you can see in the pavilion is site-specific. So Sung conceived it, uh, especially for the pavilion of Madame in Luxembourg, and she conducted a lot of research on, um, on Luxembourg, on bureaucracy in Luxembourg, and of course um, the country being, uh, and the city being also uh, the, uh, the location for many European institutions, may, many uh, bureaucratic institutions was, uh, played a role in, um, in the, the, the specific topics that she addresses in the exhibition. Any other question? You identified the 19th century as a sort of moment where bureaucracy became a topic in literature and art. Um, so I was wondering what you think it was about that time or that moment in history and how we were living um, that sort of brought that forward. And then the second question, I'm going to wrap two into one. Um, in a lot of the examples you cite here, it, there is a sort of Western element yeah. or moment. 
when looking at, I don't know, for example, a variety of communist re regimes in Southeast Asia, there is a sort of similar or greater even tyranny of, of bureaucracy. And have you looked at sort of art from that geography and how it maybe also deals with bureaucracy? So I, I, was, I was trying to think whether I could give like a specific example which is specifically about bureaucracy. And I mean, maybe, maybe you have an example for, so I, I, I haven't. I mean, I know that um, in terms of Sung Tzu's work specifically, I mean, she grew up in, in Germany and so her work, at least the work I'm familiar with, mostly deals with, with that situation, for example. But in, of course, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that in, you know, in, in various, everywhere there is a modern state, whether democratic or totalitarian, right? Like you have a bureaucracy and so you would have that kind of like response. Now, I can't think of specifically Southeast Asian or, you know, in, in some sense, I mean, in, in Japan, I guess, like you have it in Murakami's novels, you know, I would sort of, he's, he's obviously very Kafkaesque, um, but I can't give you a very good answer there. I mean, I'll, I'll think about it. Um, in terms of the 19th century, yeah, it's, it's a curious one. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I wrote this talk for this presentation specifically, and I'd love to do more research if there are any historians here to talk to you about it. But it seems to me that, let's say, when um, Gogol writes the government inspector in Russia in the 1830s, I believe, right, there is this transformation there and elsewhere where you still have essentially an autocratic regime, right? A regime which is ruled by more or less the, the, the ruler, um, but this bureaucratic class becomes increasingly prominent, uh, increasingly powerful as well, but people's lives likewise are becoming like increasingly kind of em embroiled in it. Um, I guess more broadly in, in Europe, you get the Napoleonic Code, right, with Napoleon's conquest of Europe. So like you get like a very kind of firm sense of, of the law as something that kind of um, governs, the, uh, governs the states. But if we then think also like later kind of in the, if I were to compare Gogol and Kafka, right, like early 19th and early 20th century, I think one thing is that's interesting is that you, you have empires that in some sense are failing you know you still have like a very strong bureaucracy in place but it's breaking at the seams right the russian bureaucracy as google describes it is very inefficient the bureaucracy of kafka experiences is of austro-hungarian empire kind of like dilapidating decaying and then defeated of course in the first world war so you have this like sense of old habits really strong kind of way of how things are supposed to be done you know your life being governed by it but you're increasingly becoming uh, aware of the pointlessness of it if you like um yeah that's how i would briefly summarize it thank you um any other question from the audience maybe a one more question if no Okay, so I think we can wrap up here. Uh, thank you so much, Vid, for this amazing lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for listening. Thank you.